see the blessing of the Lord. His word has been given to heal us. His word has been given to bless us. And so today, I'm just going to reiterate what God has already said. He hasn't given me a new revelation. He just said, do what I told you to do. And when we were here a couple weeks ago, we talked about uh, the word of the Lord was faith. Uh, God's universal economy. So say faith. God's universal economy. Say it again. God's universal economy. And I'm just going to continue to move in that vein because I believe that sometimes we don't move out in all that God has said is because we have to get secure in our faith. We have to be secure in what it is that God has already said to us. So if you have your Bibles this morning, and I'm sure you do, if you need one, you can raise your hand or you can just share with the person next to you. The word of the Lord comes out of Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. Amen? And if you have it, just stand to your feet. We're going to just, uh, we honor the Lord whether we're standing or sitting, but this morning we're just going to honor him by standing. Praise the Lord. And when you have it, just say amen. amen. Only five people have it. Amen. 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 Hebrews chapter 11. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, in the previous time we talked about this, we talked about faith and stuff things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But today we're going to come again out of Hebrews chapter 11. But we are going to be coming from verse 6. Amen? So let's read verse 6 out loud together. One, two, three. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, so must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of Awesome. Let's read it again with some fervor and some boldness. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Amen. The Lord is, the word is already blessed. You may be seated. This is such a powerful word because we have established a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we didn't just say, oh, I want to be in a relationship with him. We have a relationship with God. That means we have a covenant. Somebody talked about last week, not a contract, but a covenant. And a contract is based on something we write down and we read over a policy. We agree to the terms. And it's based on the law of the thing. But a covenant is based on the relationship. That means relationship is so connected until I cut covenant with you. Something had to be Die. Somebody had to die for me to be in a relationship. So anytime a covenant is established uh, by God, whether it's the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, whether it's the covenant that we have with Christ, that agreement or that covenant, first something has to shed blood. And so usually they take an animal that is pure, they shed the blood and they spill it between the two persons who are going to make a covenant together. And as a result, that blood was shared, it showed that a sacrifice had to be established. And that's how we have marriages. That's how we have our relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus found nothing worthy enough to die for you and I but himself. So in spite of my lying, in spite of my greed, in spite of my selfishness, in spite of my pride, in spite of my promiscuity, in spite of my adultery, in spite of my lying, in spite of my cheating, in spite of anything that I would have done, in spite of my fornication, in spite of my disrespect to my parents, in spite of smoking and drinking and drugging up my whole body, in spite of anything that we are capable of, God said, the only thing that can take that away is my blood. The only thing that cares enough for you that can die for you and not see that again is the blood of Jesus. So he died, let his blood be spilled and crucified so that when someone else would want to charge me, all they would see is Jesus. That's why we have a covenant with God. So when we talk about a relationship, we're not just talking about something somebody signed at the bottom line because they thought this was a good deal. We're not a deal to be given away as a product. The Bible says we are the body of Christ. So you are the body of Christ. 
So when we go to do anything and engage with anybody, we're giving them the body of Christ. So when we think about our covenant with God, the next time we encounter people and present ourselves to somebody, realize what you're giving them is the Lord Jesus himself. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. We have a relationship with the God of our salvation. And he's sharing with us that we made a choice to be with him. Really, it's amazing that he chose us. The, the Bible says, before the foundations of the world, God chose us. Isn't it something? If you were God, would you choose me? With everything there is to know about me, would you choose me? No. With the stuff that I've done, would you choose me? Ask another question. Would you choose you? See, when we think about God, he chose us before the foundations of the world. There's no time with God. There's no end. There's no beginning. He always was. So he knew before the foundation of the world who I was, who I was going to be, where he was going to find me. He still chose me. He chose me at the club with a cigarette hanging on the side of my mouth. He chose me in the alleyway with a drug thing up my vein. He chose you. I said, did Pastor Brown used to do drugs? Well, no, but there's somebody <laughs> who used to do them. The Bible says we become all things to all men that we might win some. And so if they need to hear that, then wherever they are, they need to know this. Jesus loves you. Whether you're in the alleyway with shooting a needle up your arm, whether you're being a prostitute on the corner, where you're crying with your heads in your hand because you committed adultery, whether you're somewhere struggling because you gambled all your money away and can't pay one bill with an eviction notice on your desk. God still loves you. That's the relationship. You might be in prison getting a clip of this video, but God is with you. The Bible says he is Emmanuel, God with us. So while we can't stomach some things that people are doing, it doesn't affect God. Your situation don't make God go, oh, oh my God, I can't believe they would do that. It doesn't put God on surprise. It doesn't put him on notice. It doesn't shock God. It doesn't make him vomit. It doesn't make him turn around. He said, I took this on at Calvary. I took this on so that you might know I prepared for you to be with me. That's the God that we serve. That's the Jesus. That's the Christ that we look up to today. That's the God who's able to forgive you and make all grace abound towards you and I. So when we talk about a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, we talk about a God that's married to the backslider, who's not going to change his mind because things don't go right, who's not going to give up on us, who's not going to say, you know what, not another day can I take this anymore. We're serving the God of all flesh. Nothing is too hard for him. So whatever you're carrying this morning, and you're wondering who can handle it, think God. Tell your neighbor, think God. Think God. That's the covenant that we established with him. Amen? Amen? Praise you, Jesus. So we're talking about without faith. And that same God, you know, when somebody treats you like that, and they look beyond your fault, and they see your needs, and you're looking for lightning bolts, and that same God comes along and puts his arms around you and tells you, I got this, and that my grace is sufficient, and I'm able to keep you from falling, and I'm able to present you faultless before my presence with exceeding joy. I'm still the only wise God, my Savior, my glory, dominion, and I'm the God that healeth thee. When somebody treats you like that, you want to do something for them. You want to bless them. You want to show them love. You want to say thank you. So you think you start sending cards and you start saying, I don't know how to say thank you, but the only thing that comes to my mind is thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. And so when God uh, shares himself with us, he tries to give us ways to please him. And so what he says in this text is, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Sometimes we're trying to sacrifice things and be disobedient by doing things that will show God. God said, if you have faith, you'll please me. 
He said, you want to know how to minister to me? You want to meet my needs? You want to minister to God? You want to show me that you love me? He said, here it is. Without faith, it's impossible to please me. And it's so funny sometimes when you want to please people, but you don't know what to give them to please them. Well, God said, you don't have to try to figure me out like that. I'm telling you how to please me. Without faith, it's impossible. You know you keep trying to please somebody and it just seems like whatever you do, minister Elaine, it's not going to minister to them. You try to please your children. You try to please your spouse. You try to please people on your job and it just don't seem to be working. Well, God said, don't be confused with me. Without faith, it's impossible to please me. I thank you for coming to church and I thank you for uh, giving to me and I thank you for, he said, but without faith, it's impossible to please me. So what I had to begin to say to God, God, and is this what you're looking for? Is this the faith you're talking about? He said, I remember I do things simple. You're not going to have to figure me out like that. I told you that it takes faith to please me. Then I told you how to get it. He said, I'm teaching you faith. If you want to please God this morning, walk in faith. Sometimes I say, well, what can I do? Walk in faith. Walk in faith. Let's go to the next slide. We saw this before. It says, if you want something in your life you've never had, you'll have to do something you've never done. And I think that's just worth revisiting because we're not here to do the same thing we did last year. We're here to do things that we've never done. And in order for us to do that, we've got to walk by faith. And so we made up in our mind, God, whatever is required, we're going for it. That may not look sensible to some people, but here's what it is. It looks sensible to God, and it produces the most amazing results because people's lives are going to be changed as a result of obeying God. And so some of you are in situations right now that require you to do something that you've never done before. That might be humble myself. I might have to humble myself. I might have to go to somebody else to find out, how do I do this? I might have to go to somebody else to say, I need help in a particular area. I might have to say, this dream that God gave me is so big, I don't know how to carry it out. I may be, it may be so small to somebody else, but it may be huge to you. It might be, I'm not sure how to manage these children. I'm not sure what step to take next in going in the direction that God is calling me. I don't know how to manage this business. I'm trying to manage my health and all the details that come with being a woman or a man or a child or a student. I don't know how to handle these finances. Well, who's handling them in a way that I can get help from them? One of the most uh, challenging areas sometimes as individuals is asking for help. And in order to go to the next place in God, I've got to ask somebody for help. Amen? Amen. There are some things God's calling you to do to write that book, develop that blog, start that business, develop that initiative that God put in your heart. All of these things is something that you may have never done before, but you've got to check with somebody to get it done. Sometimes you might have to go the next season alone without the people who used to go with you everywhere you went before. But guess what? God said, I got this. I got this. When God begins to shift you into new seasons, that means new people. He shifts you into new seasons, that means new people. God shifted Daniel into captivity, that meant new people, new language. So I gotta change my language. Stop saying the same things. Stop discussing the same stuff. Stop moaning and complaining over the same situation. God said, I have shifted you. Why are you still behaving as if you've not moved into the next dimension? So my behavior has to change. My language has to change. And this week, Pastor Dave gave it so our diet has to change. Over the last 10 days until next Wednesday, our diet has to change. Not just our physical diet, but what is your diet when it comes to what you're taking into your eye game? What's your diet when it comes to what's in your ear game? Because see, all of these things contribute to the outcome of your life. 
So if I am conscientious and intentional about what I'm hearing, then when I wake up in the morning, I don't just get out the bed and turn and let the music play. I put on the things that I want to see take place in my life. So who I'm listening to, I decide. What I put in my ear, I decide. What I put in my body, I decide. So if I don't want to hear yang yang gossip all the time, if I don't want to hear all the cursing about women and how they look and who they are, be bop ba bop bop bop, I don't have a problem with the beat, I have a problem with your words. And if your words are degrading and debilitating, why would I keep listening to that and wondering why my kids act a certain way? If you keep allowing them to hear women being called bees and hoes, guess what you're doing? You're condoning that this is what you think is okay for your children. You're condoning that this is what women are, that this is what young girls are to be called. There are enough songs with beats that don't have to put women down. There's enough songs with words that young people enjoy that don't have to make women feel like nothing. So until we become intentional about the outcome of our life, then we'll just accept whatever's being fed to us. I'm determined today that we're gonna do something different, yeah. amen? Yeah. If you wanna do something you've never done, you gotta do things you've never done to get it. Let's move on. Faith, God's universal currency. Until we get this in our spirit, because then when things come up that's required of us, that big F word doesn't raise up and try to curse us out. That F word is called fear. Every time something comes up that God's requiring of us, our question, we become sometimes like Moses. How would you have me to do this? Am I qualified? I've already established that I'm not qualified. That's why God chose me. He said he uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Then I can put my hand up. He uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. If you feel like you're foolish in comparison to God, know that you're qualified. Amen? Faith must be taught. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 19. Amen. Praise the Lord. You're wonderful, God. Here's what the Bible says, and I'm just going to read uh, the last two verses of Hebrews chapter 3 for your hearing. And it says, For who having heard rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who did not what? Obey. So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Because of what? Because of what? So he says in order to please God, he needs us to have what? Faith. He needs us to have what? Faith. Faith. And he said they did not get to enter into the promises of God because of their what? So I have a decision to make. I have to decide at what point am I ready to enter into the rest of God. What does rest look like? Rest looks like when things come up, the spirit of alarm does not take me out. Rest comes when people start acting funny. I don't have to go try to fix what it is that they're going funny over. I don't have to go try to explain myself. I don't have to go try to make everybody all right. I don't have to go try to make the family believe that it's this way. Guess what? I've entered into the rest of God. And it's called the peace of God that passes all understanding. Sometimes you do what you need to do in the natural realm, but guess what? The rest that God's talking about in this text belongs to God. Sometimes situations are all chaotic and off kilter, and guess where you are? In the rest of God. Jesus was right in the midst of the storm, and the disciples were going haywire, wondering how come he didn't get up and do something about what's taking place. Guess where God was? In the rest of God. Jesus Christ rested at the bottom of the boat while the storm was taking place because he realized it was not to his detriment. Many times there are things going on around us 
and we can't control everything that takes place. And so we get out of our place trying to go rescue people who are supposed to be relying on God. And they have now relied on us as gods, so they no longer do anything to resolve their situation because they're looking up to us to come be their God. So if they need money, come get God. If they need money, come get human God. If they need this resolve, come get human God. If it's a fight, come get human God. If something didn't work out, get human God. If they didn't get the tuition, it's, guess what? We're not God. Sometimes God allows those situations to arise yes. so that people can begin to take responsibility yes. for where you yes. used to be God. Yes. And it feels good. Yes, it does. I think I feel like 10 pounds lighter yes. from not being God. Yes. Sometimes it's okay for them to walk through the process and have delayed gratification. Yes. And we don't run in and hurry up and answer it so that they don't experience any challenges in life. And so as a result, they have a spirit of entitlement because they think that I don't have to wait for anything to take place. So when real life challenges arise, I lose my mind because I don't know how to handle somebody saying no. 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 It's okay to say no. It gives an appreciation to our children. It gives them a sense of understanding what it takes to do what it is that you do as a parent to bless your children. And at a certain point, we have to give our children the opportunity to feel responsibility. Amen? Sometimes it's not always easy watching. Do you think it was easy for God to watch Jesus Christ on the cross for something that he did not do? Usually that's not our testimony. Usually we're watching for something that we did do. But Jesus had not done. So when we see this text, he said the only reason they could not enter into the rest that God had was because of their unbelief. What does that look like in the natural realm? It looks like when you get so many bills coming into the house and you're not sure how you're going to pay them. And then you start fussing at everybody that comes through the door. And nobody knows what's going on with you acting crazy. And you just going nuts. And it's just because of the bill that came in the mail. Gian is laughing because some people are just going nuts because something took place. And before you know it, you think, and I just said, good morning. How was your day? Everything going all right? What do you think? Is everything going all right with you? Sorry, I just said good morning, just good morning, just good morning, just checking in, making sure everything's okay. But because of our unbelief, we start getting frustrated. We start getting frustrated. And so our unbelief takes us from off the ascension place and we come down and we start losing it. Rather than sitting down saying, excuse me, here's what's happening right about now. Sometimes I come in from work and the kids are all home from school, the girls are home from college, and the other girls are home from high school, and they're just talking about everything. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, when I get in the house, I'm gonna go upstairs and just take me a little 20 minute nap. And when I walk in the door, they're like, hey mom, guess what? Did you, mom, I asked you this morning to do this, you didn't do it yet. And I'm thinking, if I don't slap them in the name of Jesus, <laughs> help me, Holy Ghost. Help me walk straight upstairs so that I don't say something that's not in the word, okay, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Mom, it's nothing cooked because your hands are broken in the name of Jesus. <laughs> in the name of Jesus. Did anybody go to the market? Almost everybody in my house has a license. Why are they asking us? Does anybody go to the market? Could you please, my phone is blowing up before I get two blocks to the door. Can you stop and pick me up some hot and nuts ice cream, please? Can you stop in a Chinese store? Can you pick me up some rice? Could you please take a moment and ask somebody, did you please, pick, did you remember to do the wash? I have to take that one back because I don't wash clothes in the name of Jesus. The kids do all their own washing in our house in Jesus' name. But everything else, celebrate Pastor David for it. Amen. He is the man. All right. I'm going to tell you again. Say it again. All right, Pastor. All right, he is the man, Dad. Okay, Pop. He is the man. Because I'm telling you, I'm like, babe, you better delete that text. You ain't going to get no rice right now. 
It is rice at home. She had rice five days in a row. All that sugar in her body, we're gonna be seeing Dr. Thompson in the name of Jesus. So I'm telling you, you got to come down and recognize, how did I get all the way down here? How come I'm being God? See, God is the bomb. He got angels going everywhere. He just speak and the angels go over there. God is everywhere at the same time, but he ain't even got to send nobody. He said, I've given you angels. You angels. Charge concerning you. Hebrews tells us he's given us ministry spirits to direct when we need them. You don't need to be going everywhere. Send some angels. They come in human form. Hello? Are you on that side of town? Can you pick this up for me when you come on home? Hello? You don't have to be God. Tell your neighbor. You better stop being God. No, tell them loud so they can hear you. In the name of Jesus, go ahead and clap for yourself. Because I want y'all to realize today you're not going to keep being God. He said because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. And so that really reminded me that all we have to do is have faith. It's easy to say that when you're not the one walking through the circumstances that's causing you or requiring you to have faith for it. It's easy to say just have faith when you're not the one going through the situation to have faith for. In the particular text in 1 Kings chapter 17, it's a very familiar passage of scripture and it talks about the widow of Zarephath. And many of us have found ourselves in the same place as this widow. One, the word widow connotes that something will took place. That her husband died. And not only that, it says he died and here she is left with nothing. And as a result, she's struggling to take care of her two kids. And in that situation, here comes a man of God. Isn't it funny when you're in a situation, here comes somebody and you're wondering, can't they see what I'm going through? How are they going to ask me for something? But a lot of times in the kingdom, when we have a right mindset, that's a setup for what God's about to do in your life. So when you get that stuff in the mail and you start getting frustrated, you need to catch yourself. You need to step back from it all and say, God, give me wisdom. Because this is not for us to be foolish and overlook our bills. It's for us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And it's for us to say to ourselves, Father, where is this coming from? Where is this seeming like it's coming from? Let's step back. We need to pray, baby. Let's put this under the blood of Jesus. Let's come into agreement because we know if two or three come touching and agreeing over any one thing, we shall have what we say. So in order to do that, though, it takes faith. But the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if everything God is asking me to do takes faith, then when I operate in faith, I please God. And then if God is pleased, then he turns around and releases heaven over my life. It's that simple. So, okay, two or three come touching and agreeing, then let's pray over this. Father, we're in a situation where we want to see your glory. We're not worried. We have the peace of God because we know that God is with us. So we ask you to give us wisdom and we turn this situation over to you. We're not walking in worry because we know worry is not from the Lord. We don't have confusion because we know that that's not from God. We have the peace of God that passes all understanding. And so, Father, we count this as done. You'll give us the strategic plan for how to handle this. Then we release it and we go on in Jesus' name. And when you feel the rise on the inside of you to start worrying, then you speak out loud about it. Because faith is voice activated. So, therefore, i got to tell the enemy's unbelief to shut down. And so, when you start talking faith again, shut up, devil. Shut up, devil. Shut up. Well, how do you think we're going to do this? Shut up, devil. Don't talk to me like that. Well, I'm not really talking to you like that. I'm just really talking to the devil. But since you have to be operating, he over you. Just shut up, okay? God, I'm just crazy. Bless him. Okay, amen. But sometimes you got to say, shut up! So that you can get what God has for you. And so if you know that you're walking in that level of faith, then you keep praying for the other persons or the people that you're around you that has to operate in that process. And you keep ministering faith to them. Babe, you just be encouraged. Here's what the word of the Lord says. God said he's going to keep that which he's committed until the, against that day. 
God said he's able to make all grace abound towards us. Look at what God did with the widow of Zarephath. She was about to die. She gave up her last to the man of God. And then what happened to, the, she said, he said, go and get me a piece of cake. Go and get me the cake and bring it back to me. And she said, she only has that last piece of cake to feed her and her sons. And then they are going to die. And then he didn't stop and say, well, don't give it to me. See, God was setting her up for an opportunity. And when the man of faith, he knew that. So he came to her because he understood the principles in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 20. That says, if you believe the prophets, what is going to happen if you obey? You shall prosper. So he was the prophet. He was coming to her. He told her she's supposed to feed him. She's saying she doesn't have anything. What she's going to do is use what she has and die. Well, if you're going to use what you have and die, why not use what you have and give it to the man of God? What you want to do, just die? See, she knew enough because she was a widow of a man of God who left her in a situation where she could not afford to feed her children and herself. And what did she say? She said, let me eat this, me and my sons, and let us die. And God said, he, he said, go get me this and bring it back so that you might live, eat off of it and live. So she went and made the little cake, came on back, gave it to the man of God. Did the man of God need her piece of cake? No. I can't hear you. No. This is the challenge that we never hear in the text. The man of God did not need her cake. She needed her cake more than anybody. The man of God did not need her cake. God could have spoke to a snake in the grass, made him walk on two feet like he used to do before God cursed him in the Garden of Eden. But God gave her the privilege to get delivered by obeying the man of God. See, if you're trying to please God, you got to find out what causes God to respond. And so we're afraid to preach and teach sometimes what God says. But God said, without faith, you can't please him. And what he asks you to do is going to take faith so that you can get how God is trying to please you. So it took faith for her to give up that last little bit of cake that she thought she, she had prophesied that she was going to eat the cake and her two sons and they were going to die. How am I going to prophesy that I'm going to die? She prophesied that this is what she was going to do. And this is how some of us talk sometimes. Girl, please, it ain't going to work out. Girl, time and time again, the same old thing. Same old crazy man. Same old crazy this. Same old crazy that. Oh, girl, they're not going to come through. I'm telling you right now, they're not coming through. So here you don't prophesy death over the situation. And then when the death shows up, you want to see God. The situation don't work out, and here you don't prophesy that it's not going to work out. Then you want to blame God that it didn't work out. No, you got to speak faith. You got to be intentional. You got to decide, God, this is what I want to see. I'm not going to keep choosing crazy people. I'm not going to keep going in crazy places. I'm not going to keep not doing what God requires for me to get what I'm supposed to have. And then I want to turn around and say, God, show me. He said, I told you. I sent you the man to come through there. And I said to you, give him the cake. So she gave him the cake. He said to her, go get some vessels. What did she do? She obeyed. Now he, say it again. She obeyed him. She went and did what he said. And she only got a little bit. It was so much oil left by the time she was finished that there was not enough vessels left for the oil to be blessed in. What is it that God is causing your faith to have to rise for? For you to get what God promised you. See, we're past elementary school. This is about going to get our masters in theology, as Minister Nadine said, amen? She said, in biblical counseling, okay? Praise God. What am I saying to us? We're not going to go around this same circle Amen. 2015. Amen. We have entered into 2015 this week. 
We have entered into this season of rest. And that rest is because I made a decision to obey God. I made a decision to trust God. I made a decision to be at peace about whatever else is going on in the presence while I trust God. And so trust God doesn't mean stand there and do nothing. Walking in faith don't mean stand there and do nothing. Faith is really an action word. Because faith is voice activated. So when you see people moving, it's because they believe that they see something that somebody else doesn't see. And you asking them, where are they going? Why are they doing all of that? See, they already saw something. And their faith is drawing them by the pants to get them to where they're going. See, my faith is drawing me because I already see down the line what's about to take place. So I gotta get my faith activated so that I can stand on the promises of God because the stuff between the promise and the provision is to deter me from what it is that God's really called me to. And so the stuff that comes in the mail, deterrent. The phone call, deterrent. The spirit of a lover, deterrent. It doesn't change what God has already said. It doesn't change what I'm about to step into coming down the pipe. And so this morning, God is wanting to build your faith. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. Because you're going to have to speak faith. Amen? You're going to have to speak faith. 1 John is towards the back of your Bible, right for Revelations. 1 John chapter 5. Very familiar passage of scripture. My prayer is that this would just get in your spirit until you would just begin to say, faith, 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 faith. God, do I have faith for that? I just want to please you, God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. God, am I responding in faith? Is this what faith would do? I pray this faith will just speak to you in your dreams. It will wake you up at night. It will cause you to have to do something different. It will cause you to just get so excited about what God has for your life. Amen? Amen. And so this is the word of the Lord in 1 John chapter 5. And I just want to read from verse 1 down to verse 5. It said, whoever does what? Believe it. I can't hear you. Believe it. Whoever believes it. Does anybody believe this morning? Yes. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Okay, you got that down. Everyone who loves him, who begot also, loves him who is begotten of him. So we got that down. By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and do what? And do what? So God understands is not something we should always be saying. Oh, God understands. He does understand, but he also has a requirement. He wants us to keep his commandments. Amen? So when you go to make your decisions, and when I go to make my decisions, I have to ask myself, is this something that God would do? For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. So here's another way he's showing me how to please him. He said, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And then he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Sometimes we hear stuff like that when we're in relationships with people we shouldn't be in relationship with. If you love me, you'll... All right, let's move on to the next part of the text. <laughs> For whatever is born of God does what? Overcome the world. So then you are what? An overcomer. I am an overcomer because whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This is where we should have peace. Peace comes from the word of God. So if I'm dealing with stuff in the world, I need to know that I have already overcome that. Amen? Here's the next part of that verse. Uh, and this is, this is where I really want us to get to. Read this with me. And this is the victory that I have overcome the world. Even our faith. Even our what? Our faith. Even our what? Our faith. Even our what? Our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Our faith is what causes us to overcome the world's challenges. I'm telling you today, I don't know what you're sitting here dealing with. I don't know what you're going through. But here's what I do know. That faith is the thing that's going to cause you to go past the thing that's blocking you. Faith is the thing that's going to cause you to leap over whatever it is that look like is standing in front of you. I'm so thankful for the thing that's standing to try to be a roadblock. Because without that, I wouldn't be exercised in my faith. Sometimes we don't understand what is that there for? How long is it going to be there? God says until you got faith to move it. 
See, because I said if you just have faith as this grain of a mustard seed. Well, we know that a mustard seed ain't but so big. You mean that mustard seed faith can't take me past that situation? You mean that mustard seed faith can't cause me to believe God? You mean that mustard seed faith can't get me to get up underneath of that thing and begin to stand on the promises of God and begin to call him by name and begin to celebrate who Jesus is and begin to stand and get somebody else with me in agreement and begin to have them uphold me with their righteous arm and begin to say what God said? You mean not that mustard seed can't get me to have faith like that? Here's what the enemy causes us to do in the spirit of unbelief. I can't believe nobody see what I'm going through. I can't believe they would treat me like that. All the stuff I've done for them, I can't believe they can't come do that for me. All of, every time I turn around, I'm trying to make stuff happen for everybody else and ain't nobody doing nothing for me. I can't believe that they won't make this happen. I can't believe that this is going to be go down like that. I can't believe that this, and all this time you can't believe it. You not believe it. Because when I begin to believe, I might start out talking like, That's all right. Every time I turn around, I've been falling down and I'm separate. I'm like, oh, the devil, he is a liar. He's not going to come up in here and think he's going to just release himself all over this atmosphere. He ain't paid no rent up in this place. He ain't paid no mortgage for this house. I got the property deed to this place. I decree and declare what God said shall come to pass. And you don't even care That's because right. guess what? You believe. Yes. You got faith because you can see what's about to come down the pipe. See, Hebrews chapter 4 says, Jesus said, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame. See, y'all was looking at the whoops and how it was taking flesh off his body and blood dropping from his veins. He was looking at the other side of the crucifixion. He knew that he'd be resting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the saints. He knew that the earth would be his footstool. He knew that he'd be watching and directing divine power, just speaking a thing and it would be coming to pass. But he had to go through his go through. What's your go through look like this morning? Are you going through your go through this morning? Are you extending your go through period? Or are you celebrating God while in the midst of it? Are you calling heaven into your existence this morning? See, Jesus knew heaven was about to be brought to earth in his life. And so all he could see what was on the other side. And the reason we get stuck in this place is because of unbelief. You got to speak faith. You got to speak faith. You have to speak faith. See, when you realize you're more than an overcomer and that you have the victory in God, I don't care if it's a negative $2 balance in your bank account. You have the victory in Christ Jesus this morning. I don't care if they already signed the divorce papers and they're waiting for delivery at your door. You still have the victory this morning if you believe God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Turn there really quickly. Are you getting anything? Yes. In the name of Jesus. Say, I got faith. I got faith. Say, I believe. I believe. Say, unbelief. I believe. You a liar. You a liar. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you're watching this morning, unbelief is still a liar in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory be to God. Matthew chapter 5. I just want to let you know that there's nothing like the word of God. There's nothing like the word of God. Matthew chapter 5, 14. And this is the scripture that I just want us to read. It says, reminding us of who we are. The Bible says you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. What is God saying? He's reminding me that when you show up, you bring flavor. You preserve some stuff. You create a taste that somebody else was not able to provide. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Amen. And here's what the word of the Lord says. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? How's the salt going to lose its flavor? How's salt going to lose its flavor? Sometimes we put too much salt and it takes away the taste that we was after. 
Sometimes the salt gets stale and you have to put more salt on top of something. But salt loses its flavor as a believer when we go into environments and we just came out of the word of God. As soon as we come out, we feel the presence of the Lord and the anointing and everything we need that's necessary to go accomplish the will of God. And then we get caught up in a conversation at dinner. And before you know it, the anointing starts lifting. Starts to be a shift and you wonder where's that spirit coming from. You have given up your precious anointing for unbelief. Sometimes you get ready to go into something that you're about to experience an accomplishment or a goal. And you go in ready to do what it is God says. But right before you go in, there's an interception or an interruption. And it comes and speaks some stuff to you. And you begin to take hold of that dark rather than the word of the living God. So now your faith has gone south. That's how your salt can lose its savor. Where you just begin to no longer use salt anymore. You don't use the salt that God's put on you. So when you show up in situations, he says you are the light of the world. So you can't help but be the light of the world. Everywhere you go into, you have to be so intentional to make yourself not be light. Well, I'm going to just tone myself down a little bit. Well, I was going to wear this because it looks so cute. Well, I'm not going to wear that because I don't want people to think I'm trying to be. <laughs> oh, I know you be saying it because I have said it. Well, I don't want people to think I'm trying to be over this. I don't want people to think I'm trying to be too this. I don't What do you want to do? Be who God called you to be. You can't help it. You're light. The Bible says you are the light of the world. If you put a black on black on black on black, when you go in black, guess what? The only thing going to light up is you. Because you are, even Deacon Black is the light of the world. When he goes in, if he put black on, it's the light of the world. Amen? So when you go inside, you can't help what's happening. You're the light of the world. Your light shines in darkness. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says darkness comprehended it not. So when you come in, you can't help but be the light of the world. The Bible says if you keep reading that text, it says you don't put light under a bushel. You don't hide it with a lampshade. It says, you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill. Think about yourself, a city that is set on a hill, which cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand and gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Tell your neighbor, glorify your Father. Glorify your Father. Glorify your Father. This is the victory that we have in Him. The faith that even overcomes the world. If we're going to please God, then we have to have faith. We are the light of the world. And this is what God is saying unto us. God, I just bless you today. Turn to Psalms 119 and verse 130. This morning, I pray that you just be encouraged in your faith. God is calling you forth. And you want to please God, then anything God asks you to do is going to have to come by faith. There's stuff that God's asking and requiring of us, but in order to overcome our natural thinking, that's why the Bible says, casting down imaginations. Whatever image is in my mind about that situation, then I, if it's coming up against what God says, then I've got to shut that imagination down. Amen? I have to shut it down with the word of God. Casting down imaginations, because that's a high thing that's trying to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. And so God says, I'm calling you Gideon to deliver Israel. He says, well, I, I can't do that. I'm down here under this wine. I'm under this wine press and I'm doing, showing these sheaves in the air. And how are you going to call me? I'm not, a, I can't do anything. And God doesn't even respond to him. See, when God calls us, he's not calling my natural person. He's not calling what Bernadette is capable of. He's calling Bernadette in Christ Jesus and what she's capable of. So when God calls you, you naturally we reflect over everything about ourselves and who we are and what we've not and what we have done and what has not lined up with God. But at the end of the day, you just have to say to yourself, God knew that before he called me in the name of Jesus. And say, and he still called me. Say, and he still called me. He still called me. He still called you. He still called you. 
If you have Psalms 119, 130, read it out loud. The entrance of thy words giveth life, it giveth understanding unto the sinner. The entrance of thy word giveth light. Here God is giving us the word of God. He's, he's allowing the word to be entered into ourselves. Yes. The entrance of thy word brings light. Yes. And then what does it do? He gives it understanding unto the simple. This is what the word of the Lord does. Now remember, the word lives in us. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And without God, there was nothing made that was made. That same word came on the inside, took up residence in the person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus went and sat at the right hand of the Father. So the entrance of thy word brings light. There's an illumination going on on the inside of us. And that's why we struggle sometimes with God's big ideas. Because then we start saying, I just want to make sure it's not me and it's God. Well, you know it's not you when it's so big you can't do it without God. You know it's you when it's, you can control every aspect of the process. You want to know if it's you or not? You can manage it. You determine how it's going to go. You determine how big, how small it is. You determine all those pieces then you know it's not God. When it's God, it challenges you in every area. And the first place it challenges you is in your pocketbook. Be Hello! <laughs> because that's the place we don't want to go. And that's the place God wants to deliver us from. And so how does he deliver us? He delivers us first in our minds. Yes, yes. If you can get free in your mind that God's requiring you to do this, then you can get free to do everything else God's called you to do. So the situation looks so big, you think, how am I going to pay for that? If God told you, here comes somebody else that's so intelligent in the things of religion. If God told you to do that, won't he make provision for it? You don't have the money, but it must not be God. <laughs> Come on, if you're talking to people who's so smart that they will end up being dumb in the spirit, you'll listen to them. And before you know it, you'll defy what it is God told you to do. But when it's the Lord, he will supernaturally invade your circumstances and begin to shift circumstances to be just what he intended, what he intended for them to be. So you can't let the entrance that has come in, which is the light of the word of God, which is to illuminate our mind, to stop you from moving out in what God's called you to do. It can't, the word is not intended to scare you. The word is intended to cause us to become everything God ever ordained we were supposed to be. Tell your neighbor, stop living below your privilege. Stop living below your privilege. We're operating sometimes in fear so much, we're scared to even move out on what God said. Babe, how are we going to do this? And babe, how did, we got all this stuff and you hear they saying it? Babe, trust God. God knew he was going to have this before we ever got to this place. It's about to be on and popping, and this is just an indication of how it's about to be. I'm telling you, the roots go down so deep in the earth, it cannot not happen in the name of Jesus. God's about to sweep through here like never before. He's about to invade your life like never before. He's about to shift circumstances for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who agree with God, who walk in faith, who can believe God, not doubt and walk in unbelief. He's about to turn your world upside down in a way that is a blessing that makes rich and add no sorrow to it. That's the word of the Lord. It's not about your circumstances. It's not about what you got in the mail. It's not about what you're experiencing on your job. It's not about what somebody told you 27 years ago. It's about a now faith that God has released in the word of the Lord. And if you agree with God, you shall receive it in Jesus' name. With such acceleration, it's not going to be enough seats for you to get out fast enough to sit people in this aisle. God's about to come through so fast, there's about to be a shift, and you're about to be elevated and promoted on your job. Some of your elevation and promotion is going to come through a layoff, and you're going to think that that, oh, how the heck could they do that? But let me tell you something. It's going to be God about to elevate you and put you into your assignment. Some of you, you've been wondering, have they seen you? Why can't they recognize what you're bringing to the table? God said, because they don't see on a high enough level. Yes. Right, right, right. People see
see from where they're standing, not from where you're standing. People see from where they are standing, not from where you're standing. God is the one who sees where you're standing. God is the one. His thoughts are higher. His ways are higher. Stop expecting people on a low level to see how high God's trying to promote you. You will take a lot of responsibility off a man if you stop trying to get them to do what only God is capable of. Let me tell you something. God is using those people to position you for the next place in God. They have to line up at the word of the Lord. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. So therefore, when it's the set time, they will line up with God's kingdom agenda for your life. There will be nothing that can stop the hand of God in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as we prepare to go finish this up, faith must be taught. We recognize we've been teaching faith all morning long. We are the what of the world? The salt. Salt of the earth, we are the light of the world. We must, in order to please God, we've got to operate in faith. If without faith, it's impossible to please God. The only thing that comes against that is unbelief. We do not walk in unbelief. We walk in faith. We're more than conquerors. Even our faith overcomes the world. This is the victory that we have in him. I'm going to turn you to this last text, Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. And this is how God demonstrated uh, demonstrated that he was wanting them to understand faith. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Somebody else turn to Matthew 17. I feel like I want to teach that, but I feel like I've had you too long. So I want you to do this. Use your Mark chapter 2 for your homework. Use your Matthew chapter 17 for your homework. Amen? I don't want you to grow weary under the word of God. Amen. Matthew chapter 17 will change your mind about how things are done. Jesus is talking to Peter about going to get the fish, the money out of the fish's mouth. Peter's not used to getting money to pay for stuff like that. But Jesus was trying to show him, if you're operating in faith, it's not the way it comes. It's not because of your job that you're giving. It's not because of anything that you have that you're giving. It's because of the word of the Lord. Amen. And Matt, Mark chapter 2 talks about the four friends who had faith. And their one friend didn't have faith. He was paralyzed and he had to be picked up. He couldn't get to Jesus because of the crowd. And his four friends had so much faith, they picked him up and put him over the roof. You got to get around people who got enough faith that when you don't have none, that they can pick you up and undergird you and get you back to Jesus. Some of us have not gotten back to Jesus because we're not walking with the right circle of friends. You got to get back to Jesus. And when you hear Jesus is showing up or the word is showing up or something is taking place to get you back into position with Christ, you, can, you can't hear your friends say, oh no, I can't go, I'm tired. They're tired because they don't want to be in the presence of the Lord. So you got to invade them and love God enough to go get them. You got to go get them. And you got to begin to minister to them. And when they don't have the strength to move, they're paralyzed. Yeah. Their circumstances have paralyzed them. Their mindset is not in a place to activate their faith. You need those four friends around you who will lift you up and get up under you and put you over that roof until you see Jesus. Yeah. What's your homework? Matthew chapter 17 and Mark chapter 2. Oh, I love it. On Tuesday night, we're going to see every one of you here at 7 o'clock with your self prepared for that Matthew chapter 17 and Mark chapter 2. And don't dismiss yourself because you didn't do your homework. In the name of Jesus. Go ahead and give God a hand clap of praise to him.